The crypto yo-yo churns on, but is this Bitcoin rally different or is it simply another example of market froth? We looked at the catalyst that makes some think we could go all the way to $100,000 and some signs that there could be a sting in the tail. Yahoo Finance has all the action. Bitcoin is the highest form of property. It's the apex property in the world. And it's, um, it's the best investment asset. So the end game is to acquire more Bitcoin. Um, whoever gets the most Bitcoin wins. Whoever gets the most Bitcoin wins, MicroStrategy Chairman Michael Saylor, a longtime Bitcoin bull, raving about Bitcoin as an investment, the digital asset reaching new highs this week, coming off the launch of spot Bitcoin ETFs. Crypto-related stocks such as Coinbase also doing very, very well, up roughly 50% since the start of the year. Next guest saying that there's still a compelling upside case to the crypto exchange. We want to bring in Devin Ryan, Citizens JMP, Director of Financial Technology Research, joining us now. Devin, it's great to have you here at the desk with us. So just first, your reaction that we've seen to the massive increase in the price of Bitcoin and obviously Coinbase, a big beneficiary of that. Yeah, absolutely. First off, great to be here. Um, what we talked about, we actually put a report out last night. There's been $10 billion of net inflows into these ETFs over the last two months. We are saying that we think there will be $220 billion of additional net inflows into these ETFs over the next three years. So uh, the comment is that the ETFs are truly transformational for this space. Um, what we're talking about with the ETFs is there's $25 trillion of financial advisor-driven money that really hasn't even been allocated yet. And the ETFs open the door to that part of the market. And so, um, of course, yes, when there's big demand, the $10 billion is driving prices higher. And then ultimately, that's really good for companies like Coinbase because they're benefiting both from the ETFs directly and trading those, but there's a lot of interest in crypto more broadly. So their trading volumes are up over 100% uh, in the first quarter over the fourth quarter. Um, and then, you know, bigger picture, Coinbase to us is really a play on just the evolution of the asset class. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, I think, what people have missed so far in the stock. And that's why we think there's still quite a bit of upside because they're going to evolve their business model with the evolution of the asset class. In terms of flows, when we look at Grayscale's Bitcoin ETF, definitely struggling a little bit. I see the smile there. Uh, over seven and a half billion dollars of exodus there in the first 30 trading days. Is that an idiosyncratic issue for them? Or is that indicative of maybe some outflows to come for other names? Yeah, I think they're really specific. So there's at least a couple billion dollars of the of that you just cited that's related just to some of these bankruptcy estate sellings. And I think that's already generally played out. And then there's also some selling from you know, people that initially got in to Grayscale because they were just playing the, the trade around you know, the premium that uh, the GBTC was trading to Bitcoin several years ago. And then ultimately, even more recently, the discount. And I think there were some you know, traders in that. And so some of those folks have exited. And then you're seeing a little bit of rotation, too, where you know, some people have been selling that ETF and going to some of the lower fee ETFs. So they actually just announced yesterday uh, another ETF structure. So I think they're going to be back in the game, um, you know, potentially bringing in inflows. But yeah, I think of that as really uh, idiosyncratic. And then the net flow story is really what we're focused on, which is $10 billion over two months. You mentioned the fact that you see Coinbase's business evolving, the platform evolving as the industry does. How so? And what does Coinbase need to do in order to maintain that edge? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really the key story. We've been framing Coinbase's, you know, it's a little bit cliche, but the Amazon of crypto. And what I mean by that is, you know, they got into buying and selling, you know, as an exchange, realized that was the first foray into crypto. That's becoming increasingly commoditized. Now, there's still going to be huge growth in the exchange platform. But Coinbase is really the primary on-ramp or one of the primary on-ramps into the asset class. So if folks want to get uh, involved in payments or remittance or, in our opinion, tokenization of real-world assets, Web3, you know, they have their own uh, blockchain uh, called Base. You know, they're going to be involved in virtually every aspect of how this industry grows. Uh, and then there's going to be parts of this industry, in our opinion, that are really idiosyncratic to crypto. So you know, staking is an example, and there'll probably be other innovations. So Coinbase is going to be involved in all of that, as they already are. Their subscription and service revenues were essentially zero in 2020. Now they're $1.5 billion. I think those are going to grow a lot faster than even the exchange 
change part of the model. So that's really, you know, simplistically the story. And I think what a lot of people have missed that it's all about trading and uh, you know the Bitcoin ETF and less about these other areas. And those other areas are really what's going to be what drives the revenue growth over the next decade. Yeah, certainly. We're taking a look at Coinbase up another five percent today. Devin Ryan, always great to have you. Thanks so much Thanks for having so on for with us. Me. Bitcoin surpassing its record high this week, notching a fresh record of seventy-three thousand after a roller coaster week for this volatile digital currency, to say the least. To break down Bitcoin's moves for us, we've got Yahoo Finance's very own Jared Blickery here. Jared, what are you seeing? Well, another record high, and let's look at the price action over the last five days. Uh, here we did, over the weekend, we came in to the week at about 68,000. We took a little bit of a dip Monday, and then we rallied to just short of 60, or excuse me, 72,000 or so. And then we, uh, we sold off all the way down to 69,000 yesterday. A rather dramatic reaction, it looked like, to CPI, but now we are back at these fresh records. And just looking at a longer term, this is a five-year chart where we can see these these record highs in the rear view mirror now, uh, a lot of people ask, okay, well, now that we're at record highs, what is the target? You have big round psychological numbers, so 100,000 is a real easy target. There's all kinds of ways to come up with Fibonacci uh, extensions and other methods with measured moves of coming up with higher uh, highs that are potential higher highs than existing prices, but uh, probably save that for another day. What I do want to show you is what's happened in the crypto market over the last seven days. Uh, here we have Binance token, left for dead, but up 25%, got the settlement with CZ probably in the rear view mirror, Algo's up 14%, Litecoin having a great week, 10%. So my point is, it's not just the big guys like Ethereum and Bitcoin uh, that have been surging recently, it's a lot of other stuff here. And that was something that was missing in the run-up in Bitcoin last year. Uh, we did not have that broad participation. Now Ethereum, this is a five-year chart similar to Bitcoin, but it is not yet Get taken out these record highs. 4,500 is the big number, although it did pop a little bit above that. And finally, I just want to show what's been happening with the Bitcoin ETFs. This is a huge new asset class, and I'm getting reminders of that uh, back when GLD, that is the first gold ETF launched in 2004, a very similar time. Before that, there was not a good way for retail investors to get into gold. You could own uh, physical gold, you could do some other things, but for the most part, the ETF made it mainstream. This is saying here, two of the top five ETFs in terms of flows this year in the United States are Bitcoin, and we're talking $10 billion for uh, IBIT, that's the iShares Bitcoin ETF, and then the Fidelity won $6.2 billion. These are just high high numbers, and in my opinion, it's difficult to see it uh, not, not increasing from here. Uh, there's just a lot of momentum behind the sector, and so my ETF analogy re uh, remains. GLD is to some of these ETFs now. Well, despite declines for Bitcoin today, MicroStrategy shares, well, they're higher. TD Cowan raising its price target on the stock to $1,560. That's $1,560 after MicroStrategy increased its Bitcoin holdings by another 12,000 Bitcoin. The total holdings about 205,000 now. Joining me now, MicroStrategy Executive Chairman Michael Saylor. Michael, it's good to see you. It's been a little while. Thanks for having me, Jillian. So I want to start. I know that you're bullish on Bitcoin. I think everyone knows by now that you see a long-term um, store of value in Bitcoin. And you have said that you see it as digital property as opposed to thinking of it as a digital currency. So if you could help me understand as you add more to the company's balance sheet, what the sort of end game is for those holdings uh, on MicroStrategy's balance sheet. Yeah, well, we think uh, Bitcoin is the highest form of property. It's the apex property in the world, uh, and it's um, it's the best investment asset. So the end game is to acquire more Bitcoin. Um, whoever gets the most Bitcoin wins. <laughs> well, um, I, I, there but is I guess, no other end game. But, but Michael, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, so if I think of it as digital property, and I think of analogies, right? I think of a real estate company that buys property and holds on to other kinds of property. They may not be the apex, but whatever kinds of property. I think of an asset manager that buys all kinds of different assets. Eventually, they sell those assets in order to make profits. But I, I don't think that is your end game, right? You're not planning to sell the Bitcoin at any point. So kind of <laughs> what is the purpose of it over time? Well, um, let's keep in mind the, the fundamental principle. What, what's the use case of Bitcoin? It's, it's capital preservation. 
So if you have a billion dollars and you live in South America or you live in Asia or you live in Africa and you want the capital to last for 100 years, you're not going to want to buy a billion dollar company or a billion dollar building or a billion dollars of land in any place in Africa. You're going to have to find some other form of property that you can hold for a long period of time. Uh, let's take New York City. Uh, developers of New York City in 1776 didn't have an end game. Uh, they've been raising capital to invest in New York City real estate at the all time high for 300 years. If you went and talked to them today and you said, what's your end game? They would say, well, we're going to keep investing in New York City. If you've ever talked to a person that owned an apartment in New York City, no one aspires to hold the apartment for a few years, sell the apartment and move out of New York City. They put it in their will. They give it to their children. And if you ask them why, they say there's no better place on earth to live than New York. There's, there is no place up from there. So New York City is the end game uh, for people that, uh, that want to live in the greatest city in North America. Bitcoin is the end game for anybody that wants to own the greatest property in the 21st century. Well, I, I guess that is the case. But, uh, you know, at, is there a price at which you would consider selling some of the Bitcoin, pulling out? So, I mean, because you don't you can do something with New York City. You can live in New York City. You can have a business in New York City. You, you know, w what do you do with the Bitcoin besides it just gather value? Well, um, the proper real estate developers in New York City, uh, they're not buying the real estate because they want to live in it. They're buying the real estate because they expect Well, because they want to sell it eventually, desirable. Michael. I mean, let's be honest. Most of the people who are, uh, yes, sure, some people pass it on to their children. But like most of the people who are buying assets at some point want to sell the assets at a profit. So let I me, get, let me say it a different way. Okay. People that use fiat currency as a store of value, there's a name for them. We call them poor. Okay. Uh, anybody that's rich in the world, they own property. They own they own large swathes of land. The royal family of England, it didn't sell all of its property in central London in order to buy. Uh, you know, currency or paper money, nor did the royal family of uh, of Japan, nor did the royal family in the Middle East. In fact, they want to own the property forever. I, I, I wanna, want you to imagine Bitcoin is, it's a city in cyberspace that's 276 blocks wide, 276 blocks high, 276 blocks deep, about 21 million blocks. Now imagine all 8 billion people in the world want to live there one day. They want to put their capital there. There's $900 trillion of, of wealth in the world. As people migrate from, uh, from every other form of property and they've assets into cyberspace, you're going to see the Bitcoin network go from a trillion dollar network to a 10x that to 100x that. And there really is nowhere else to go. It is the apex property of the human race. So at some point, as the value of the Bitcoin on MicroStrategy's balance sheet grows, both because it's growing in absolute terms and maybe you're adding more to it, do you at some point down the line see being able to use it to transact, to invest in the business, to pay out a special dividend to investors, to buy other businesses? We, th we believe that the, that the highest best use of capital is to buy Bitcoin and hold the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is going to appreciate in value faster than the S&P index. It's going to appreciate in value faster than commercial real estate. And so there, there's no point in selling the winner to buy the losers. And Bitcoin is the winner. And so we're just going to keep acquiring Bitcoin with our cash flows, with, uh, with equity or capital raises, uh, any other any other uh, accretive uh, method that comes to mind. Um, something else I've noticed as I've talked to different investors, different analysts, is that MicroStrategy is actually trading at a pretty steep premium to Bitcoin itself. According to one uh, analysis that I saw today, as much as 90 to 100 percent premium to Bitcoin. Is that is that justified? And, and why do you think it's justified? Right now, uh, an institutional investor that wants to buy Bitcoin has a choice of uh, investing in the ETFs, of which you know BlackRock and Fidelity and are, are very well known, 
or investing in some other company that has a Bitcoin strategy like MicroStrategy. Uh, you could think of the ETFs like, uh, like ocean going container ships. They can carry huge amounts of capital. You can invest a billion dollars a day in the BlackRock ETF. So they could, they could take on hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. They're not gonna trade at a premium, but what they don't have is performance and leverage. MicroStrategy is different because uh, our capital isn't, you can't redeem our shares. So it's possible for our shares to trade at a premium. We're an operating company. And that means when our shares trade at a premium, we can either raise capital through convertible debt or through equity. When we do that, we're doing it at a premium to the underlying assets that captures uh, an accretion for our underlying shareholders. So following uh, a debt deal where we swap the debt for Bitcoin, our common stock shareholders have more Bitcoin per share than they did before the deal. So another way to say that is, if you want to pay 25 basis points and be one to one levered, then you would buy the ETF. But if you actually want to generate an accretion or a yield and not pay the fee and have leverage, then you would buy a stock like MicroStrategy. You could think of us as like, uh, we're like air freight, we're Federal Express. We can take you faster, but we're never gonna carry the same amount of capital in our payload as a super tanker or a container ship. So there, there's place for both of those strategies. And in fact, they're very complementary. I think the ETFs benefit from the existence of companies like MicroStrategy and MicroStrategy benefits from the existence of the ETFs. Yeah, certainly we've seen um, an uptick in adoption with the, the introduction of those ETFs. Um, you mentioned the convertible offering. Um, I am curious because it, it's not the only offering you've done. Of course, you've done others as a way of investing in more Bitcoin. What happens if the price goes down again precipitously? What happens to the capital structure of MicroStrategy? Well, you can see, uh, if you look at our past, there have been periods uh, during the crypto winter when Bitcoin went from 66,000 all the way down to 16,000. Uh, in that case, we simply hold the Bitcoin. Instead of being 20% levered, we become 40% or 60% levered. Um, the, and the way that we raise the capital is using convertible debt. And so the convertible debt is an is a unsecured uh, instrument is not marked to market. It doesn't come due uh, except in four five or six years from the point that we issued it. And uh, it's not secured against any other kind of capital. So we don't have to actually do anything. We just wait uh, for the market to recover. And, and that's what we did uh, in 22 and in 23 we recovered and our shareholders benefited from the deleveraging as Bitcoin rallied in the other direction. We're looking at how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook. As Bitcoin hits another all-time high, how much further the asset can climb is a hot investor debate. For a look at it, how to play it, we're joined by Dan Dolov, Mizuo, America's Senior Financial Technology Analyst, and Matt Balanswag, BitGo Managing Director, Head of Go Network. Dan, let me get over to you, because uh, you've been really, you've been covering these stocks for a long time, Coinbase, Robin, Robinhood, you name it, whatever it is. How, what are you telling investors at this moment? Stay away. Stay away as much as you can. Why? Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a, it's it's in my view, it's still like a, I, I don't see the the reason for people to. I mean, a coin. I mean, let's talk about Coinbase specifically, right? They're a take rate business, and take rates are always bound to be kind of a race to the bottom, and eventually uh, there's going to be more competition, and 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 they're already getting, they're already giving out pricing concessions. So if you in January they gave out a pricing concession for people who are trading five hundred thousand or above. So pricing pressure is starting and competition is heating up. So I think uh, I, the fact that I don't believe in the underlying currency, uh, Bitcoin, that's one thing. But irrespective of that, I think Coinbase is, is you know, that minus uh, take rate pressure and competition. And I just want to quickly follow to you, Dan, and before we get to Matt, um, because you do have, as I understand, if I'm not outdated, a buy rating on block, which obviously is a, a much different business, but also there is a crypto tie-in there. So is your buy rating sort of irrespective of the crypto side of that? Actually, you're, you're making like probably one of the best points ever. So <laughs> I didn't uh, even know. Give you a, <laughs> this, is, this is like a genius comment because 
I'm old enough to remember that back in 2017 and 2018, uh, and even 2019, the reason Block or Square at that time was performing so strongly was because of the correlation with Bitcoin in the last cycle. And guess what? It broke. And the correlation the, the, the correlation doesn't exist anymore. Does that tell you anything about Coinbase? It probably does. But on on Square specifically, Bitcoin is like single digit part of the revenue. I mean, 95% of the revenue has nothing to do with Bitcoin. And that's that's the reason I'm bullish on it. But by the way, same thing for Robinhood. The you know, I'm I'm super bulled up on Robinhood, but not because of crypto, because of everything else, because of what they're doing in retirement, because of their growth in Europe, because of the the you know the leadership in equities and and taking share from Charles Schwab. So, this you know, Bitcoin and crypto is the the least important stuff in my view. Now, let me get you in here because nothing nothing goes up in in a straight line. And, and if investors are getting a little worried about this move in Bitcoin, how fast it has come on. Are there certain warning signs they need to be on the lookout for that there might be a pause in the cards? I mean, you're Look, seeing I mean, it right now. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was. I thought it was a question. Yeah, I want to feedback. Yeah, no. I think. Look, um, I think you have to view this a lot bigger than than any one specific company or any one you know pullback or drawdown. This is a global shift in the way people think about portfolio construction. I think Pandora's box is now open entirely. Anybody can buy Bitcoin through their brokerage account. Uh, institutions are starting to pile in through the nine new Bitcoin ETFs. And the flows really don't lie here. There is demand for BTC as an asset. Um, you know, BlackRock through the IBIT ETF did $2 billion in volume yesterday. Um, you know, in total, the ETFs now hold over $55 billion in just their first 60 days of trading. So the, the, the flows really don't lie here. And even more importantly than just some of these short-term metrics around demand is you have two of the largest you know, asset managers in the world in Fidelity and BlackRock. These are multi-trillion dollar assets that have so much clout and weight on the market and can really drive what institutions do and how they think about their portfolios endorsing Bitcoin. Fidelity the other day um, you know, put out basically three different core portfolio structures all which recommended crypto as a percent of that portfolio. You know, this has dramatic implications on how hedge funds, asset managers, the whole RIA market thinks about utilizing crypto in portfolios. And to me, this is just the early innings of, you know, that transition. So, you know, I do think, sure, could there be pullback and, you know, if things get too hot? Definitely. Um, you know, I think we've yet to see retail really pile in as though they have in previous cycles. Um, so, you know, as funding rates start to become more expensive, as folks require more and more leverage, uh, you know, that that will put pressure on the market. And I'm sure at some point we will have a pullback. But I think zooming out, you know, this is really a generational shift uh, in, in the way that, you know, crypto is going to be viewed institutionally uh, and at the retail level. Matt, um, what is the best way for investors to get involved if they want to buy Bitcoin? What are the relative merits of buying it through one of these ETFs versus investing in Bitcoin itself? Yeah, I think, look, it's gotten a lot easier to get exposure to crypto and Bitcoin over the last few years. Um, you know, I think the floodgates are now open because it's extremely easy through the ETFs. So, you know, there's a few ways. Obviously, you know, folks need to consider, one, just the cost of, you know, some of the ETFs, uh, you know, that are in existence. You know, these can be as expensive as 1.5% if you're talking about Grayscale, uh, you know, or as cheap as 12 BIPs, uh, you know, if you're talking about some of the others. Uh, other things that need to be considered are, you know, who's who's the counterparty, right? Like who's actually holding the underlying Bitcoin here? And if you look at, you know, uh, ETFs like BlackRock and Fidelity, a lot of them are using Coinbase. Uh, BitGo is also another custodian that's starting to win some of the custody deals for a lot of the ETFs. Um, you know, BitGo obviously is a state chartered trust entity in both South Dakota and New York. So you do have to kind of look at the underlying, you know, who's my risk to? Um, but I do think, you know, other ways to get exposure outside of this, the ETFs are buying spot crypto yourself through one of the platforms out there. You know, that could be BitGo, it could be Coinbase, it could be some of the other exchanges like Kraken or Fidelity. Um, and then obviously investors can think about other things, whether it's, you know, buying volatility, uh, utilizing options or other derivative contracts such as futures. Uh, and then obviously there are other public equity proxies out there as well. Um, you know, obviously Coinbase stock and MicroStrategy or some of the minor companies like Hut8 and Marathon. So there are now a host of different ways to take exposure to the space. Um, but I think investors really just need to think about the actual volatility of the asset, 
you know, the counterparty risk of who they're facing and the platform they're holding those assets on. And then what are the fees and costs associated with getting that exposure? So you know, I, I would advise any investor to just kind of do their diligence in that sense. Bitcoin and stock bulls are charging. A new frenzy surrounding the world's largest cryptocurrency is pushing the price of Bitcoin to all time highs. This is all things AI have powered stocks such as Nvidia and Microsoft to new heights. So our major investing exchange is cashing in on all this excitement. Vlad Tenev, Robinhood co-founder and CEO joins me now. Vlad, always nice to get some time with you. I know you do a lot of these interviews, uh, especially a couple weeks after earnings, but I'm like, I have to connect with Vlad because your stock is rallying, the broader market is rallying. On your platform, what have you know, these record setting markets done to that platform and what are you seeing uh, among people? Typically when the crypto markets see uh, a lot of excitement, we benefit from that. You know, we're one of the largest crypto platforms um, in, in the US. Um, we've been growing market share and that's continued uh, through 2023. I think last time I was on your show, we were talking a little bit about that, but um, it's definitely not just crypto. Uh, we've we've seen increased levels of activity with the markets across all of our assets and products. So people have been uh, entering the equity markets. Uh, options trading has been up through 2023 as well. Uh, equities market share went up about 14 percent. Options market share at Robinhood was closer to 20 at about 19 percent. So as we've been improving our products, we stand to benefit when there's heightened market interest. Have you seen the, the rally, AI stocks, crypto, whatever it is, is this pulling in the next generation of investors? I think you're, you're seeing a couple of things. Certainly there's heightened retail interest and you're seeing investment apps uh, getting, uh, getting more downloads. You can look at kind of the public app store rankings and there has been a resurgence in interest in investing. Certainly we've benefited from that. Um, but what's really interesting is um, it's not just uh, it's not just the markets and it's not just individual AI stocks in crypto. Um, you look at our retirement business, more and more people are interested in retirement as well. So we announced that we had 1.7 billion in assets under custody in retirement accounts at the end of last year. And recently our CFO was at a conference. He said that number had close to doubled at over 3 billion just in a couple of months. So um, there's general interest in long-term investing as well. And we're excited to be serving that market. Are investors still looking at Robinhood as, as a trading platform? Because I've been following a lot of the work that you and your team have done really over the past 12 months, a lot more innovation, 24, our trading, a push into retirement products. Do you ultimately want to be that one-stop destination for, you know, that maybe perhaps replaces going down to your local bank branch and, and using it for whatever you want to use it for? There's three things that we're focused on right now. Number one, uh, we want to be number one in the active trader market. So active traders are very important for us. Uh, they care about very specific things like performance, pricing, user experience. And we're making lots of investments there, both in the user experience and in new product innovations that other competitors don't offer. 24 hour market being a great example there. But we don't want to just serve active traders. And so we wanna grow wallet share with our customers. We wanna help them build wealth. And that's the second priority. And that's where Robinhood Gold and our high yield products come in. That's where retirement comes in. And of course, the credit card where we're entering a new product category that's very important to customers. And then the third area of focus is expanding internationally. I think the last time I was at your show, we, were, uh, we had just announced the UK launch and we had also launched in the EU. And we see a huge opportunity there, hundreds of millions of consumers that are underserved and that's sort of our beachhead to the rest of the world. What is the size of that credit card business? How big could that be 12 months after launch? And where exactly are you with that product? One of the reasons we're so interested in the credit card market is it's so big, right? Um, 
over 80% of US adults have a credit card, at least one. Um, there's hundreds of millions of credit cards in circulation um, in the US alone. And if you look at the credit card market in general, we see three things. Number one, it's large. Number two, the incumbents are enjoying very large margins. So the, the profit pools in that business are very large. And the third is it hasn't really been digitized yet. So the experience of a credit card, I mean, sans Apple Pay is pretty much the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, and when we see those three things, we see a great opportunity for us to enter the market and, and disrupt. So um, it's, it's getting close. The team's been working hard. I've seen the designs and we'll be, uh, we'll be looking forward to unveiling it shortly. Vlad, just before you came on, we had the um, opportunity to talk to uh, SEC Chair Gary Gensler. And, and towards the end of the conversation, they were talking a lot about crypto and the moves in crypto. Uh, the chair noting uh, that the sector is rife with uh, abuses and frauds. And uh, at some point, you know, maybe the investment public is putting their own investments at risk. I mean, bigger picture, I, what do you think about this move in crypto? And, and do you think investors truly understand what they're getting in the crypto space right now? Uh, I think if I had to look at this move, um, it, it's, you know, we, we see uh, a supply and demand imbalance starting with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? So all of these new ETFs came into the market. They've been gathering assets. We're now able to more easily plug institutional interest, of which there's a lot, in, uh, in crypto. And they've been, they've been generating more demand. You also have the, the Bitcoin halving where there's less supply coming in, and I think the market anticipates that. I do think um, the crypto space is quite broad. It, it refers to a lot of things now, including you know just coins that a couple of software engineers overseas can launch on an exchange. And I think with that level of decentralization and sort of uh, uh, access are risks. But then you look on the other side of the spectrum and there's significant institutional interest in adding Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies into customers' portfolios. Uh, more and more large institutions and endowments are starting to look at it. Um, governments you've seen uh, start to look at it too, um, like El Salvador, for instance. But I think we anticipate that might not be the end of that. Um, and, and so I think that's very much entered the, the mainstream as, a, as an asset that customers need and, and look, uh, look to add in their portfolios. Vlad, you've been uh, leading this company really through two, like a, a series of big moments for investors. Of course, a couple of years ago at the, the meme stock frenzy, but right now markets at all time highs, crypto all time highs. What lessons are you putting to play today, leadership, operationally, whatever it might be, things that you learned a couple of years ago, what are you putting into play now? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, a couple of years ago felt like a different world. You know, it felt like we, we didn't really have to um, operate particularly well as a company to do well. In, in COVID times, the tide sort of lifted all boats. Now, uh, starting in 2022 with the increase in interest rates, you know, it sort of washed out a lot of uh, a lot of the excess in the markets and we've had to operate differently. So just emphasizing efficiency, performance, focusing on the things that are incredibly important, making sure that the team is aligned and, and we've got the top talent. I think these are all things that the management team and myself have learned over the past couple of years. And now when we see a little bit of a recovery and you know, if, if interest rates then start dropping, as many are predicting, we should see that turn into a, a tailwind for the business in a, in a big way. Uh, it's always uh, great to get a few minutes with you. Uh, thank you always for making time for Yahoo Finance. Vlad Tenev, Robinhood co-founder and CEO. Have a good weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brian. Gold and Bitcoin both reaching record levels. You've got gold just around eyeing 2200 level as investors becoming a little bit more optimistic about rate cuts this year. Now, Bitcoin climbing above $72,000, that reaching that level 
for the first time ever. Let's talk about the massive climb to the upside and what's behind this record-setting rally. We want to bring in Ben Emmons. He is the New Edge Wealth Senior Portfolio Manager, Head of Fixed Income and Macro. Joining us now, Ben, it's great to have you here. So explain to us and the viewer here why we're seeing the record-setting run-up in both gold and Bitcoin at the same time. I think it's all about supply, Shana, uh, because you know in both cases there's very limited supply, and if you then have an, let's say uncertainty, which may be dealing with a little bit currently, and a lot of talk about Fed easing and they may go as soon as June, typically that gives gold a lift up. In the case of uh, Bitcoin, it's about this having event in April, and people calculated that although the final having event is like a century from now. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a limited asset class of supply. And I guess that if we're in an environment of liquidity, easing, and uncertainty, these two assets get lift up. And it's to be worth paying attention to because this is, I think, kind of a unique year going into the election. Now, the price of gold also, as you know, has an inverse relationship to treasury yields. So what's the anticipated kind of knock-on effect that we're expecting in correlation here? As an interesting point, Brad, because go back to 2011, when we, that was a year of huge uncertainty. Debt ceiling, euro crisis, lots of things going on. And gold hit the first time its record high. And at that moment that that happened, there was a lot of decline in treasury yields. Now, partly it had to do with what the Fed was doing, partly it had to do with the euro crisis. But it was a kind of an interesting combination to see that about a decade or about later, during the pandemic, the similar event sort of happened, record highs in gold and lower treasury yields. Again, Fed influence there, but similar idea. So we're back to record highs, maybe going even higher, and we're sitting with Treasury yields at pretty much at the, at the high end of that range. So I'm wondering like, if we're getting real uncertainty, as in, okay, we don't know who will be president, we don't really know if the economy actually stays this strong, all those kind of questions. You could actually see this idea of like high gold prices, lower Treasury yields, so it's something to watch. Ben, what do you think, when we look ahead just to tomorrow, the very short term here, the inflation print, what is that going to potentially do to activity here? Well, I think it will be somewhat volatile because, you know, the last inflation print, there was an expectation that headline inflation will go below 3%. That didn't happen. Since that time, we've had more energy prices going up. Um, we've also had some data out on rents. We had some data out from the PCE and PPI data that all indicates stickier inflation. So there's an expectation that actually this, this print will not break the 3%. And why does that matter? Because you know, ultimately, it's about headline, right, for the consumer. If that were to really start declining, um, you know, that would really change, I think, the perception about how, how much more the Fed could cut, potentially, beyond what they're saying now. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're sort of sitting here waiting, like, this, this number could be a little hotter, given where the economy is, and also what's happening with energy prices, plus what, during the testimony came out, that they're also looking at high interest rates have also risen the cost of housing, which shows up in inflation. So it could be a, higher, a hotter number. In our Yahoo Finance Interactive across the studio, our, our viewers can't see that, but uh, they keep tossing up Bitcoin from time in time out. And I keep taking a look over your shoulder at that. And at these levels that we're at, I mean, you're a very reasonable man, Ben. You're a marathoner. <laughs> you're you're well-calculated here. How high can Bitcoin go as you think about the scarcity that you were just laying out a moment ago. Yeah, and see, you know, this comes together with the demand for Bitcoins from these ETFs, as your colleague mentioned, like, you know, it's $10 billion or so have got into those ETFs, and those managers have to buy the actual coins, right? It's no longer with futures or, or other proxies. But that relies on people who already hold Bitcoin being willing to sell as well. Exactly, and there's been limited selling. Uh, if, if not any, I mean, there, you could have uh, websites that you could track the liquidation of Bitcoin. That's very limited, that's happened so far. And then you have this halving event, which again, that is actually slowing the rate of Bitcoins together with how it gets produced and mined. So it comes all together in one, and then I think that's a cocktail of like, yeah, then it breaks out above the highs, and how it can it go? Well, sky is obviously the limit. My guess is it's gonna go probably like 100,000 or so, that will be your first sort of major milestone I think don't be surprised that you actually reach that level. So Ben, what, what is your advice then to investors out there? Should they tread carefully given the fact that the price of both of these assets is so volatile? True, because you know, let's face it, like the, the gains are extraordinary, particularly for, gain, for, for Bitcoin. I think they've calculated from somewhere like more than 10 years ago, you had bought one Bitcoin, you've made like 7 million percent. You know, will you make the next 7 million? Now that's volatility obviously, right? So clearly, you want to be careful. but. 
Think about the long-term prospect of the asset as well as in gold. You know, why do these exist? Now, most of the institutional investors don't really play in that space until maybe now. That's, I think, one other force behind this, that it could go higher. Secondly, it is a diversification because if you have that high of a gain or expect a return against where equity volatility currently is, which is really low, that is a possibility for diversification in a portfolio. So it has become a more serious asset, I think, ever since the, uh, the SEC approved those ETFs. So and given the, uh, the institutional interest currently, yeah, that, that's, this is becoming an asset that is a diversifying asset, scarce asset in the portfolio. And, and is what's true for Bitcoin expected to be the same for Ether or Ethereum? Because now we've got applications lining up for Ether or Ethereum, that's still a heavy topic of conversation okay. and contention. Uh, I won't wade down that route, but if we see ETFs come forward, if we see more utilization come forward on the Ether side, is what we've seen in Bitcoin in this run-up expected to be the same there? So one difference with Bitcoin, with Ethereum, is that Ethereum has unlimited supply. Right. Because it's, it's a gas, right? That's actually how it's created. But people looking at the correlation between the two, and people have always said like, well, Ethereum is really the benchmark for blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the fundamental reason for the digital currency to exist, is that central banks may not go all to digital currencies just yet, case in point, the Federal Reserve, but the implementation of blockchain technology is supported by central banks, and that supports Ethereum. So once that also gets approved as ETFs, you'll likely see the similar sort of interest from institutions and, and retail and uh, public to buy the ETF on Ethereum. Absolutely. Ben, great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks Absolutely. for having me. Bitcoin surging to another record, briefly crossing above 72,000. You can see it just around 71,800 bucks right now. Other crypto related stocks are also seeing a boost from the recent rally in Bitcoin, driven by optimism from the SEC's approval of the spot Bitcoin ETFs. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler spoke with Yahoo Finance last week about that decision. Let's take a listen. I thought that it was the most uh, sustainable path forward, uh, along with the commission to approve those. And investors uh, got additional disclosures based upon those exchange traded products. Uh, they get certain protections on the stock exchanges, but they should also, I would say, be aware it's a highly speculative, volatile underlying asset, Bitcoin. All right, we want to bring in Marion Labor, Deutsche Bank's a senior economist. Marion, it's great to have you here. So talk to us just about the recent run-up that we've seen in the price of Bitcoin. You've outlined a number of factors driving it. What are the biggest catalysts? Yeah, hi, many thanks for having me today. So yes, indeed, there are um, few reasons why Bitcoin reached a record high. Uh, first, uh, the ETF has just been approved uh, last January, and we have more ETF uh, coming uh, as well. We are also going probably to have like a few central banks interest rate cuts, uh, which are all approaching. Uh, the Bitcoin halving uh, is become very near now, uh, and regulation is also coming this year. And one of the areas where we're seeing even more kind of coziness for it is the UK. And so where more globally are we going to expect some of the allowance for ETPs or exchange traded products for cryptocurrency and specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum, perhaps, to really continue to fuel this rally? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, today in the UK, the FCA uh, has just softened stance on the sector by permitting Bitcoin and Ethereum backed uh, exchange traded nodes. But we are also seeing this year more and more regulation worldwide. Uh, for example, in the EU, uh, MICA regulation will take effect uh, in stages as well. Uh, Rolls governing stable coins will uh, become enforceable starting uh, next uh, quarter. In the US as well, uh, we have regulatory action uh, which have accelerated despite uh, the lack of uh, overarching rules. We have around like half of the CFTC enforcement actions in the last fiscal years. Uh, which involved uh, digital assets. Last year, uh, the SEC stood by Nance and Coinbase uh, as well, and we also had uh, the highest civil monetary penalty ordered uh, in any CFTC, uh, which was made against a fraudulent scheme uh, involving Bitcoin, and it was uh, equal uh, to 1.7 billion dollars. And 
if I look at regulation uh, as a whole, I really see it as a net positive development for the industry. Uh, if we have a clearer regulatory framework, uh, which might have uh, increased corporate adoption and higher liquidity, uh, which is probably going to result in less concentration. And uh, ultimately, uh, it's going to help address uh, volatility in the crypto um, asset space. So, man, do you think it's likely then that we're going to stay at these elevated levels? So yeah, I, I think uh, there are good reasons uh, why it's at this uh, elevated uh, level, and uh, it's probably uh, going to stay uh, to stay high. Um, I mean, if I look at the future, uh, we just you just mentioned ETF, uh, the spot Bitcoin ETF, uh, which was AFO, but we have also more ETF uh, which are likely uh, coming. Uh, the SEC first decision on the spot Ethereum ETF application is expected uh, mid May. And uh, overall, this uh, evolving ETF landscape and participation of institutional players uh, are helping uh, crypto mature into a more established uh, asset class. And just lastly, while we have you, Marion, uh, the having how much of a catalyst could that be further for, for Bitcoin specifically? And, and does that mean that the global coin market cap as well can, can see not just a rise on the back of Bitcoin, but does that present a rising tide for the rest of the other smaller currencies? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Uh, the Bitcoin halving, uh, which is the fourth Bitcoin uh, halving actually, uh, is approaching uh, in about a month now. And this fourth halving uh, will have the reward again from the current 625 down uh, to 3.125 Bitcoins. And if we look at the previous halving events, uh, for example, if I take the more recent one, uh, there was a sizable 27% price increase in the months before uh, the 2020 halving. If we look uh, at what happened in 2016, uh, we had a more substantial 13% gain. And if we look at the 2012 halving, prices rose by uh, 5%. So every time we have an halving process, uh, prices tend to rise before, around 30 days uh, before, but also slightly after uh, the halving. H having said that, uh, on your question about like the global crypto market, uh, I also think it's important to distinguish Bitcoin uh, from uh, the other largest uh, cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at uh, the 100 largest cryptocurrencies, uh, only six are at or near uh, all-time high. So not uh, all cryptocurrencies are uh, equivalent. And again, Bitcoin uh, has the largest market cap. Uh, and the market cap uh, is also like three times larger, bigger than the second largest uh, cryptocurrency, which is Ethereum. Marion Labor, who is the Deutsche Bank Senior Economist. Thank you so much for taking the time here with us today. Thank you.